Good morning. A great joy to see you. Uh, we continue the book of First Kings. First Kings chapter one. Last week we saw the foolishness of nature, the rebel son of David trying to take over a kingdom that was never given to him. Now the story continues. We saw last week that God preserves his kingdom. So let us look today as God raises a true king in his quest of preserving his kingdom. God raises a new king or a true king, if you will. I'm going to read from verse 28, chapter number 1, to verse 53. And it reads as following. Then King David answered, Call Bathsheba to me. So she came to the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king saw, saying, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversary, as I saw to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me. And he shall sit on my throne in my, in my place. Even so, I will do this. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground and paid homage to the king and said, May my lord King David live forever. King David says, Call me Zedek the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Baania the son of Joida. So they came before the king, and the king said to them, Take with you the servant of your lord and of Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. He shall then come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place. And I appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benia the son of Joida answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, say so. As the Lord has been with my Lord and the king, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord, King David. So Zedok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benia the son of Joida, and the cherites, and the Pelitites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. There, Zod of the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on harps, playing on pipes, and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished feasting. And then Joab heard the sound of the trumpet. He said, What does this uproar in the city mean? While he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abijah, priest came, the priest came. And Adonijah said, Come in for a worthy man and bring good news. Jonathan answered Adonijah, No, for our Lord King David has made Solomon king, and the king has sent, has sent with him Zedok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Bani the son of Joida, and the Charites, and the Palatites, and they, had, and they had him ride on the king's mule. And Zedok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, have anointed him king at Gohem. And they have gone up with the with there. When they gone up from there rejoicing, so that the noise in, in an uproar. So that is the noise in an uproar. This is the noise that you have heard. Solomon sits on the royal throne. Moreover, the king's servant came to congratulate, congratulate our Lord King David, saying, May your king, may your God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours. And may his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. And the king also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. Then all the guests of Adonijah trembled 
and rose, and each went his own way. Adonijah appeared Solomon. So he rose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Then it was told Solomon, Behold, another appear King Solomon, saying, Let the king swear to me first that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. And Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hair shall fall into the earth. But if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came, paid homage to the king. And Solomon said to him, Go to your house. May the good Lord add a blessing to the reading of his weight. May he write his eternal truth upon our hearts. Church, today's teaching aims to show us that Though God is sovereign, yet he used ordinary people to accomplish his purpose. He used ordinary men and women like us to bring to pass that which is his will. Last week we saw the story of Adonijah, the man who wanted to see his own glory than seeing the glory of God. The man who wanted his own way than the ways of God. The man who wanted to lift himself up instead of humbling himself that the Lord may lift him up. We saw last week how greed leads people to hatred. As Adonijah hated Solomon without sin. As Adonijah also hated his father. King David, he was sick, laying in bed, but Adonijah did not care about David who was sick. He only cared about himself being a king. He never came to say, oh, King David, you are sick. What can we do? Can we pray? Can we do whatsoever? But he saw an opportunity to become that which God never aimed him to be. Of course, last week, Adonijah was still rejoicing, remember. He was running around wearing his red t-shirt, riding his red horse, rejoicing, calling himself king. But there was a counter-attack that we spoke about at last. A counter-attack whereby Bathsheba and Nathan comes to King David, telling David what Adonijah had done. There was a plan behind the scene to oust this man, to show the whole world that this man was not the true king. Therefore, today we are looking at how did that plan work. Church, from the passage that we have read this morning, verse 28 to 53, we see that before us is a new dawn. After a period of corruption and self-centeredness in the kingdom of God, after a period of self-enrichment, after some funny time of singing your own song and dancing to your own tune, we see that God brings about hope, a new dawn, a new leader, a leader after his own heart, a leader who will care about the people, a leader who will put the people first, a leader who will put divine priorities first, a leader who will be kingdom-minded, a leader whose aim will be to build the nation and unite God's people. That is what we see before us this morning. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of confusion and possible genocide, God brings order into the kingdom. And the way in which God brings order into the kingdom is God bringing a true king. God taking out that which is false and bringing that which is true. God making Solomon a king after David. Therefore, before us is no longer that cloud, that black cloud, that dark cloud, which Adonijah was bringing into the kingdom. But before us now, it's a bright future before the people of God. The future is unfolding. God has preserved his kingdom from the hijacker Adonijah, the rebel son of David. God is making sure that it is always a future for his people to look forward to. 
before us is Solomon rising to power. Solomon is rising to power, change, not by his own will, not by his own strength, but by the purposes, by divine appointment of God. This morning Solomon is confirmed to be king. He is confirmed by the people, he is confirmed by David, but above all, he is confirmed by God himself. And I want us to look at that under two thoughts this morning. Firstly, I want us to see the king in the making. If you look in verse 28 to verse 40, you see the king in the making. We're not going to read as we have read. You can just have it on screen. And then, because it's long verses, I don't want to be here until 12.30. So let us not read everything. We already read that. Church, the wisest decision a man can do is to take the right step. The wisest decision a man can do is to do the right thing. And before us is King David doing the right thing. A wise decision surely is a God-centered decision. If there is a decision that you must take and you think it is a wise, wise decision, you need to ask, is it a God-centered decision? Church, whatever we, we, we are called to make decisions on a daily basis. Life leads us into making decisions. But a wise decision will be that which is a God-centered decision. For David, it was the decision to make Solomon king. And this decision is motivated by Nathan the prophet. This decision comes as God's will and God's purpose into the kingdom of God because David had been reluctant in acting. Consequently, the kingdom was at the brink of ruins at the hands of Adonijah, the rebel son of David. Because David failed to make a decision, the kingdom was laying in ruins. It is important to make a decision at the right time. So after that stent, which Adonijah did to hijack the kingdom, we saw that God sent Nathan and, and, and Bathsheba to come and speak to the king, to advise the king, to bring a wise counsel, if you will, to bring a wise counterattack that Adonijah should be taken out of the kingdom. Then because of that wise decision, that Nathan did because he listened to God, because he knew what was God's way, what was God's purpose. Then he spoke to David, and that wise decision changed David's mind. David remembered God's promises that Solomon will be king. David remembered his own promises to his family that Solomon will be king. In verse 29, David leads by example, and it is very important for parents to lead by example. We see in verse 29, David leading by example, he is thanking God for saving him. The first thing, he thanks God for saving him, not just to keep him alive, but for saving him. The one who redeemed his soul from many diversity, he says. That's very important for us, for each and every person right now to give praises to God for the salvation that you have obtained, to ask God for salvation that you do not have if you do not have. It is important for each and every soul this morning to praise God. God's praises must go up from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. King David says, first of all, I thank God who saved my soul from many from many diversities, from every adversary. David knows that the Lord has saved him. David knows that the Lord has done something marvelous for him. He has snatched him from the garbage of sin and preserved him from many different dangers, from many situations that challenged him. It was God who was there for him. So if God was there for him, why would God change now? That is David's question. Perhaps in his mind. If God was faithful before and he kept him so far, 
Why would God not be faithful now and allow Adonijah to be a king, though God had never promised that Adonijah would be, would be king? So now David rises up from his bed, a sick man. He rises up from his bed and he makes the right decision. He remembered that he promised to be faithful. How is he going to be faithful? He remembers how God is faithful to him. You need to remember that God is faithful to you and that should motivate your own faithfulness. So David remembers that God had been faithful to him. Now he needs to be faithful to the oath that he took that he will make Solomon king after him. So this king in the making is a king that is promised. This king in the making is God-given king. He is a chosen of God. He is a love, the one that is loved by his own by his own father. That is the king in the making. So David, he gathers the important and faithful servants of the kingdom that were still remaining. He calls Zadok the priest. He calls Nathan the prophet. He called Abidia. He called all those who were faithful. Regardless of the fact that there were many people following the rebel, sometimes people follow rebels, and the group seems to be so much, so many people, so many people, they seem to be running the show. But church, there's one thing that I want you to realize here. <coughs> there is still a faithful few. God always has a remnant. God always has a few people that always keeps up with his commandments. So regardless of the fact that everybody was rejoicing, jumping around, praising, singing Adonijah's songs, there were still a few people holy, accepted unto God. There were still a few people set apart for God's purpose. God will always have a people to stand over, if you will. Remember the story of Noah, when, whereby everybody seems to have rejected God and everybody was against God in their doing. God preserved eight people that he will save for himself and start over, if you will. God had a remnant. It may seem so dark and it may seem that there is no future, but God always keeps a people that will do His will. Remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where everybody seems to be standing against God, where everybody was wicked as it were. But God saved Lot and his daughters. God had a remnant. God will always have a remnant. God will always have a people calling but calling to his name. Remember when the prophet Elijah was stuck and he thought he was the only one left who had not bowed, knee to bow. God assured him that he had preserved 7,000 men who had not bowed their knee to bow or kissed bow. God always has a remnant church. God always has a people to start over. Even then, in our time of chaos and disorder, in our time of rat eating and false worship, God has a remnant, a people that will call upon his, upon his name. People saved by grace. So that is what we see here. David, though it looked as if there was nobody on his side, he calls in Zadok the priest. Nathan the prophet, Abitia, he calls them all those faithful men who were all not only faithful to David, but they were faithful to God. And he calls them to himself. He gives them, he gives them a mandate. He wants them to appoint this king who was waiting, this king who has been promised by God. He, they must show this king to the nation. Church, when God has proposed something, to happen, it will happen. Men may do whatever they want to do, but God's will will be done as it is done in heaven. Adonijah had, had his own ways and his own thoughts, his own plans and his own purposes 
but God had one purpose and one purpose only to bring about a history that will lead to his Messiah who was to come. To bring about a history that will give us sort of a picture of this Messiah that was to come. And that picture cannot come from a false king like Adonijah. That priest, the picture is to come from a promised king. And that king, we are told, is, is Solomon. So this king in the making comes through God's sovereign will. And no one church can stand against the will of God. There was a lot of people following Adonijah. We saw that last week. There were parties, people jumping around rejoicing. There was dancing, there was clapping of hands. There was sacrifice. Even they sacrificed to act as if what they were doing was something from God. It seemed last week, it seems in the previous verses as though the devil was on the wing. But not so, church. We see that there was a counter-attack. We see that there was something happening behind the scene. We see that God was still pulling strings behind the scene like a puppet master, making sure that history goes exactly in accordance to his will. Even in our own lives today, it may seem so dark, it may seem as though the devil has taken over, but we see in this story that God is in control. Jesus is still seated on the throne, and his gospel continues galloping throughout the world, making all sinners who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, telling them to be saints. God is in control. Jesus is sitting on the throne, ruling Jesus is sitting on the throne, bringing God's purpose to pass, even, even this morning. So God used Adonijah's foolishness to give David a wake-up call. Sometimes bad things happen so that we as Christians may wake up. There are things that happen in our life as Christians, there are things that cause us to prayer because it has happened in our life because maybe we were slow in prayer maybe our faith was not tested enough so God used this foolishness of Adonijah to give David a wake up call to tell David it was a time for a new king to show each and every one of us that we must learn that we must not delay your godly responsibility if God has put something on your hands that you must do for him, do not delay your godly responsibility. You must learn that procrastination brings forth terrible consequences. To leave the things that you must do and think you're going to do it in another time, you cannot buy that time again. There might be serious consequences. David learned from the foolishness of Adonijah. We must learn from the wrong things as well that happens in our own lives. But this also gave Nathan a wake-up call that it was time for a new king. Those who hold, those who has the word of God to preach, those who must bring about the good news to people must not wait until it is the last minute. They must not wait until something wrong is happening. As, 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 as Nathan waited, he waited until it was the last moment, until the kingdom was almost snatched, as it were, from King David. He waited. Don't wait. May the word of God burn in you like fire that you may speak the word of God at the right time. And speak the word of God before it is too late. He learned. We learn. But also this foolishness was a wake-up call to the people of Israel. It is a wake-up call for each and every one of us. We realize that the people of Israel, as Adonijah lifted up himself, making himself a king, they accepted him. Church, don't just accept a charismatic leader just because he's got charms and moves. You need to accept something that has godliness in it. Just the fact that Adonijah had the moves. Just the fact that Adonijah was a handsome man. The Bible says he was handsome. Just because he was wearing nice clothes, as it were, or he was driving a beautiful car, putting it in today's language, doesn't mean you must follow. You need to look at godly characters. 
The people of Israel failed to look if this man was truly the king after God's own heart. He put himself as a king. He does not have the approval of King David who was the king at the time. He does not sit in the royal throne, but still they consider him a king just because he's handsome, just because he's got the moves, just because he's charismatic. They learn, we must learn. Not everyone who speaks good needs to be the leader. Not every good idea is a godly idea. They had to learn, and they learned the hard way. So in the making of this new king, we realize that error is being corrected, and hope is restored. That is what God does. He corrects our errors and restores our life in giving us a new king. If God gives us a new king, a true king, error in our lives must be corrected. Our lives must be restored. We must never be the same people again. This nation will not be the same nation again. This nation will be led by a man after God's own heart again. And their error of accepting just anything is corrected. They are restored because God gives a new king. A new king corrects errors. A new king restores the people. That is what God does in a new king. So Solomon is called in as this man are gathered. He is called in and he is put on a mule. He is put on David's own mule. He is put on that mule to parade before the people in the whole country. Church, that is true kingship in the line of David. A son of David is on a mule. A son of David is riding on a donkey. People are shouting and screaming and they are glad. People are singing as the Bible tells us, Long live King Solomon. <clears throat> if this was the New Testament, people would be on the street laying down palm branches, letting the king, letting this new king, this true king ride on a donkey to walk and ride on palm trees. If this was the New Testament, they would be shouting and singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. If this was the New Testament. And you know, it happened to someone in the New Testament. Because this is a true king in the line of David. A true king is the one that is set by God. The one that will lead his people, Israel. Church, this is the sign of true kingship in the line of David. In verse 39 and 40, the Bible tells us that said of the priest to the horn of oil, from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew trumpets, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. All the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with gladness, so that the earth was split by their noise. You see, greater rejoicing than the rejoicing of the past. People, when they were rejoicing in sin, they had a guilt to conscience. Although they were dancing around, making sure that everybody thinks they are happy, but their noise did not split the ground. When the children of God are joyful, the whole world sees this joy. There is something that is changing in the environment. The earth is split. There is something that is changing. Because the people of God are rejoicing in this new, in this new king. Church. This is, not, this is not just a story that you must know history. This is not just a story to keep you going. Church, this is God's story. This is God showing us. This is God pointing us how he does things. How faithful is he? How he will preserve his people? How he will preserve his kingdom? How he will establish his kingdom on a king after his, after his own heart? So it has to be a man, a man of God's choice, leading the people of God's own heart. That is what this is about. A man of God's choice, leading the people of God's own heart. God, for a little while, may let his people be led by a stranger. 
God for a little while may let his people be led by a hypocrite. But there will come a time where God moves the stranger, where God put away that hypocrite, where God shows his own power, where God shows his majesty, where God shows his people who the king is, that they may look up to the king, that they may gaze upon the beauty of that king, that they may follow the right king and do the right thing. For a little while, it may be dark, but soon, light shall come. That is what we see here. So though we are looking at David's decision, this whole thing is about David's decision, but you can see, church, it is not really David's decision that we are looking at here. It is God's perfect plan. God has a perfect plan for his kingdom. God has a perfect plan for his people. His plan is to lead his people to victory. His plan is to make sure that his people rejoice in the Lord, that they may sing and say, the joy of the Lord is mine. That was God's plan. He had promised before. He said in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 6, It is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house. It is not Adonijah the stranger. It is not Adonijah the hijacker. It is not Adonijah the hypocrite who will build my kingdom, who will build my house, who will build my courts. It is Solomon, your son, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Not every leader is accepted by God, unfortunately. But there are those who are accepted by God. And God will make sure that his people acknowledge those who are set by him. So this is not David being smart, making a right decision. This is not Bathsheba and Nathan being persuasive. No, church. This is God being faithful even after a period of chaos and disorder, God remains faithful. You see, sometimes God does not save you from chaos. You see, he didn't save these people, this nation, he didn't save David from this temporal chaos. But sometimes God takes you through the chaos. Why? So that you may see his power. So that you may see when he takes you out of the chaos. He didn't save them from the chaos. He take them through the chaos that they may see his power and wisdom. So when dust settled, and now Adonijah is celebrating his own fabricated victory, Solomon is made king. While Adonijah was jumping around, eating, the Bible says they were feasting in verse 41. While they were feasting, Solomon is made king. The God line of David is in power. It has to be the God line of David in power in the throne. There is one thing, church, I want you to realize about this God, the power of this God line of David. There is one thing you should realize about Christians, if you will. Those who call upon the name of Jesus. God's chosen people. What you see in Solomon is that Solomon does not come out and say, as Adonijah did, I will be king. There are no words from Solomon's mouth saying, I will be king. Solomon is not proudful like Adonijah was. There is always a difference between the children of men and the children of God. There is always a difference of character and approach between the children of God and the children of this world. The children of God, they wait for God to lift them up. The children of this world, they lift themselves up. That's why they fall so hard. Adonijah didn't wait. He says, I will be king. His words, Solomon does not say that. He waits on the Lord. That's why we say, wait on the Lord. Adonijah waits on the Lord. He knows that whatever the Lord has promised, the Lord will bring to pass. Whatever man can have, it can only come from God. He knows that his time will come. He knows that his time is in God's timing. That is what you see with the children of God. But more so, we don't see Solomon quarreling with Adonijah, fighting for position. The children of God in this world don't fight, we don't find them 
fighting for, for power. They are not involved in power struggles. They know that God gives them what belongs to them. They wait. They wait in the Lord. Solomon did not even bother to fight for what rightfully belonged to him. He didn't fight. What did Solomon do? What should you do? He put his future in the hands of a faithful God. He waits for God to answer. He prays the Lord day in and day out and wait for God to make the move. That is Solomon. He knows that finally whatever God has given to him will come to him. Solomon is not like the Christians of today who knows how to claim it and receive it. Solomon is not claiming it and receiving it. He knows that he doesn't have that power. He's young. He, he can only wait on the Lord. He leaves everything into the hands of a faithful God. He's just like David. David, his father. You know, that's why I said last week and I'm saying it again. It is important for parents to lead their children right. Just like his father, church. David was anointed king and he waited years before he sat on the throne. He waited years before he was on the throne. He waited years before he was on the throne. David waited years after anointed king. He didn't rush, he didn't quarrel with King Saul. We see the very same character with Solomon. No quarreling. That is what we are taught in the Bible. We must stop quarreling. David waited on the Lord. Now Solomon is waiting on the Lord. He does not quarrel with Adonijah. The, 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 the world says, fight for what is yours. That's what the world says out there. And the false gospel and the false preachers today, they say, claim it and receive it. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, wait on the Lord. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The Bible says, no one can have anything unless God gives. Wait on the Lord. Pray without ceasing. And you wait on the Lord. And the God line church will always wait on the Lord. The God line will wait. Will wait on the Lord. David failed. He failed to name Solomon king at the right time. But that was David's right time. God's right time is now. And God named Solomon king. This king is in the making. In other words, it's not from a perfect family. You don't have to come from a perfect family. David was not perfect. He was a man, just like all of us. You can see he had faults, but still, from that imperfect family, God brought the true king. You don't have to be from a perfect family for God to use you. But what is necessary is the words that David spoke saying, I thank the Lord who redeemed my soul from many adversaries. There has to be a God who has redeemed your soul from many adversaries. There has to be a God who has snatched you from the garbage of sin and put you unto his marvelous light. Not perfect people, but a godly line, a godly people. God is not looking for perfect people, church, but is looking for ordinary people that he will make, he will make perfect. And you see that in the story of Solomon being made king. But the second thing I want us to see in verse 41 to verse 43 is the king in the palace. Now, King Solomon is in the palace. What I want you to see here is what characteristics, what kind of a character what comes out of Solomon when he is in the palace? We know what came out of Adonijah when he was in his own palace. It was pride. It was greed. But what is it that will come out of Solomon? 
And church, as we are reading here from verse 41 to verse 43, we, we, we come across a very amazing truth, if you will. Sometimes someone else's joy can be bad news for you. Sometimes someone else can be rejoicing about the very same thing that is stressing you out. And you see this kind of a life happening between Adonijah and Solomon. As Solomon now is rejoicing, Adonijah is not rejoicing. So as we read this text, you realize that fake victory give no peace. Adonijah had his own victory that he made for himself, but he doesn't have peace. Fake victory does not give peace. Hatred and corruption leads to ruins. Men make joy last but for a little while. You need the joy of the Lord. We'll see that just now. So when Solomon is rejoicing here, Adonijah received bad news. He's sitting around feasting in verse 41, and then they hear a noise. They hear singing, they hear screaming. They even feel the earth shaking and split because of the noise that was happening. There's an uproar, the Bible puts it. Now he's questioning joy, actually, the, the army man, the man who's always in dark, the man who always hear what is it that must be taken off physically. He's hearing this noise and he's saying, what is this noise about? What does this mean? mean? And he's asking, before they can even answer, we are told that George, uh, what is his name? Jonathan. He comes in. There's a man called Jonathan. He comes in with bad news. Not good news, bad news. He says, no, the uproar means this. King David has made Solomon a king. There is good news in Israel. But there is bad news in this little house. Because someone who has made himself king is not the true king. But David has put in order a true king. Now Solomon sits in the palace. Now Solomon sits in the place of glory. Now Solomon has all power in his hands. God's chosen one is on a throne. A throne made by God. Not a man-made throne. Not our man-made thrones that we have in this world. But God's own throne that he has made. Adonijah is told that the true and devoted priest Zadok and Nathan the prophet had anointed King Solomon. Not only is Solomon anointed and accepted, but David, the father of Solomon, blessed Solomon. Remember now, Adonijah never got a blessing. It made me think, I know we don't believe probably as people, I'm not saying as Christians, but probably as people we have left the belief that your parents must bless you when you do something. They must have a good heart in what you do. They must approve as it were. Of course, sometimes there are things they don't approve, which are godly things that we must just maybe do. But it is important that your parents approve. Adonijah did not have an approval of his father. Now, with David's own mouth, David, here in verse 48, is blessing Solomon. And throughout the history of the Old Testament, every father that has blessed a child, that blessing meant something. You remember Joseph blessing his people? You remember how Jacob blessed his sons? You remember how Abraham was blessed and those in him are blessed? Blessing is very important. Abraham blesses Isaac. Isaac blesses his sons, Esau and Jacob. It goes down, Jacob blesses his own son. And one of his sons is Joseph in, in, in Egypt. 
And Joseph also blesses his brothers and he says to Judah, the scepter will not move away from Judah. In other words, the kingship that does not even belong to Judah will be with Judah, knowing that the land the tribe of Judah will come. So blessings are very important, which come from godly families. Not just families, godly families. Here is a blessing in verse 48. And King David also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted me someone to sit on my throne this day, my own very eyes seeing it. So not only the people approve of Solomon, the king approve of Solomon. Because it is easy for the people to approve of a king. They've just done that with Adonijah. But this king is different. Firstly, he's approved by God. Second, he's approved by his father. Then, he's approved by the world, by the people. The difference is Adonijah started on the last one, approved by people. And he was never approved by God, never approved by his father, but he approved himself. So God approves a man. And now the king approves the man. And the nation, we are told, approve Solomon. So Solomon is in the palace while Adonijah is in hiding. You read verse 41, down, Adonijah is hiding. Sin is keeping, up, is keeping him away from people. He's got shame. He's ashamed of the things that he has done, which is right. Be ashamed of the things that you do. But it's something that you must not learn from Adonai that I'll mention to you just now. So he's hiding for, for his life. Solomon is in a place of glory, while Adonai is in a place of ruins. A place of gnashing of teeth. That's where he is. He's in fear. The Bible says he feared Solomon. Not because Solomon is dangerous. That's not what this year is about. Because you know exactly what you did. And that's okay. That's alright to be fearful. But don't hide forever. So he's filled with fear because of his sin. You see, he was joyful two days ago. And today, that joy has been taken away from him. It is different from the Christian. The Christian may mourn. The Christian may lose whatever he loses. But the Christian will never lose the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord remains on the Christians. Whether in tears we have the joy of the Lord upon you. Whether in suffering we have the joy of the Lord upon you. Because that cannot be taken away from you. But the joy of men. The joy that you get from the things of this world can be stolen away from you. So Adonijah is in hiding. We hear that the noise of rejoice is troubling him. The Bible says in verse 50, he feared Solomon and he rose and he went and took a horn in the altar and he, he hold on that horn of the altar. Is a sign of fear, sign of running away. But there's a problem here, sir. And ma'am, there's a problem here. What is the problem? He acknowledged within that he has done wrong, but he's not acknowledging his sin that he will repent from it. The fact that he's running away and hiding, he knows he has done wrong, but he's not coming up. To repent from his sin. That is the problem. He's running away and he's hiding. He's doing exactly what Adam, his father, did. He's doing exactly what we all do. Running and hiding because of sin. He's hiding. He doesn't have the power and the ability. Nothing is pushing him to ask for forgiveness. That is his brother on the throne. But he's not asking for forgiveness, he's running away. He has the power to run, the ability to run. But he doesn't have the ability to run into the person who must forgive. He's running away. We all run, run away from God. We don't run to God. Adonijah, 
is one of us. After he has done such a great and terrible sin, evil is found in him and he runs away like the rest of us, trying to act like a victim. Now he's sitting there hoping for the best. You can't sit there and hope for the best. You need to lift up your eyes unto the king who sits on the throne. Lift up your eyes unto this king who sits on the, in the palace. Only that king, only King Solomon can do something about his situation. Running away from Solomon will solve nothing. Running away from this king that comes from God will solve nothing. Running away from this king chosen and given by God will solve nothing. He even knows where Adonijah is hiding. This king knows. I'll show you to you just now. He knows. So how, where can you hide in this little kingdom? Where can you hide? We are exposed. We are visible as it were. Unto this king. So he acts like a victim. But when he was stealing, he was acting like a hero. When he was doing wrong, he was acting like he was doing right. Now he is hiding because he knows he had done wrong. His conscience is condemning him. But he does what is worse. He is not asking for pardon. He hides himself. The question how long will you hide? Because your sin will catch up with you. How long will you hide? So don't lock yourself in hiding because of sin. And forget that God can still forgive you. That's why he forgot. Solomon can still forgive. Solomon does not have a history of brutality like Adonijah. So there's a possibility of forgiveness. Even if he does not get forgiveness, he deserves what's coming for him, whatever it was. He had to just stand up. So when Solomon sat on that throne, when Solomon was lifted up as it were, when Solomon was in the palace, the first action, the first thing that you, you see, and that is where I was coming into this whole thing. The first action, the first character, if you will, the characteristic of this king that you see while sitting on the throne. The king in this palace shows something of a godly character. Adonijah has locked himself in hiding, demanding, not asking, demanding forgiveness. Thinking that he deserves forgiveness. Thinking that because he is the son of David, he is also one of them, he deserves. Thinking that because God created him, he deserves. But what do we see with Solomon? Verse 41. Okay, verse 41. Then he was told, Solomon, this is what Solomon is told. Behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon, for behold, he has laid hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to him first. You see now, he wants Solomon to swear to him first that he will not put that his servant to death. There is no asking here, there is expectation. How do we sin and expect forgiveness without asking for it? That is what Adonijah is doing. But church, as we move over and we read this, as we move, we realize that Solomon does not count Adonijah's sin. Solomon actually wants to remember this sin no more. Solomon wishes that sin, this sin can be bloated away. He wishes that his brother had not done this wrong. He wishes that his brother can be forgiven, that he must have a new life, if you will. The Bible says Solomon forgave this man. It says, Solomon said, if he will show himself a worthy man, not, not even one of his hairs he will lose. Not even one of his hairs will fall into the ground. If you will show a wealthy man, I want you to, to underline those words, those words, a wealthy man. Someone is using words 
worthy man to a man who's not worthy. I'm saying so because a worthy man will not have done what Elijah has done. A worthy man will not have come against his own family. A worthy man will not have wished to put his own brother to death. A worthy man will not have wished to steal that which does not belong to him. But Solomon says, if he shows himself a worthy man. In other words, if he shows himself to be a man who has repented, a man who has changed from who he was to be something else, none of his heads will be put on the ground. Do you realize that? Solomon is forgiving. But he puts a condition. We shall look at this condition just now of his forgiveness. But the important thing here is that Solomon is forgiving. But the Bible tells us, church, that not only did Solomon forgive, it is good to forgive. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, and amen for forgiveness. It is good to forgive. We can forgive. God forgives. He teaches us to forgive. But it's something more that Solomon is doing. Something of a godly character. Something worthy of a king in the palace that he is doing. What is Solomon doing? The Bible says he forgives his brother and he sends forth men to look for Adonijah because you know where he is. You cannot hide from this king. He sent men to bring Adonijah back home. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. A king who forgives and brings the sinner back home. Can I have an amen? amen. A king who forgives and brings a sinner back home. Because when Adonijah sinned, he lost his right to be part of the family. When Adonijah sinned against his father, when he sinned against his brother, when he sinned against the kingdom and he sinned against God, he lost everything. He was an outcast. But here is a king who calls back on the outcast. Here is a king who looks for a lost sheep. Here is a king who goes and search and looks for his own brother. Remember, church, Adonai is not just a brother here anymore. He is an enemy of God. But here is a Solomon, a king who forgives God's enemy, who forgives his own enemy. That's why, church, forgiveness is very important. You cannot continue with your life without forgiveness. You cannot continue without being forgiven. You cannot continue without you forgiving someone. Forgiveness is important. That is what Christianity is about. That is what Christ hanged on the cross for. He hanged for forgiveness. There has to be forgiveness. If you don't have forgiveness, you have nothing. But it's very important as we speak of forgiveness that you get forgiven, but also you remember that you are forgiven. I'll get to that just now. Listen to what this person says, and I quote, just to show you that you cannot move without forgiveness. You cannot please God without forgiveness. Holding grudges against someone causes spiritual deterioration. You cannot move without forgiveness. Listen to what this person says. He says, forgiveness is for our own growth and happiness. When you hold on to hate, the things of the past that hurt us, when you hold on to pain, when you hold on to resentment and anger, it harms us far more than it harms the offender. Forgiveness frees us to live in the present because without forgiveness, we live in the past. Forgiveness frees us to live in the present. Forgiveness allows us to move on without anger or contempt or seeking revenge. It is important to be forgiven and to forgive. That's why the prayer says, forgive us our trespasses as we also forgive those who trespass against us. Solomon forgiving the one who trespassed against him, not only forgiving him, bringing him back home. He's not forgiving and says, life goes on, see what you can do, continue with your life. Come back home. Come home. Sinner, come home. You are forgiven. 
Come, he says at the end of the chapter, go to your house. There's a house for him. His house is not destroyed just because he's a sinner. Come back home, he's told. But yes, the last thing I want you to see here, as we come into closure, I want you to realize that forgiveness has conditions. There are conditions to be met. Remember what Jesus said in that woman caught in adultery? <coughs> in John chapter number 8, the Bible says, Jesus stood up and he said to her, Women, where are they? Meaning, where are those people who are trying to condemn you? Because you have sinned. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Here's the condition. Go, and from now on, sin no more. There's a condition in that forgiveness. Go, and now on, sin no more. Solomon says, if he shows himself, this Adonijah, if he shows himself to be a wealthy man, not, not being that rebel that he used to be, not be the hijacker that he used to be, not to be a false leader that he used to be, if he shows himself to a wealthy man, a man who has changed his ways, if he shows himself, not even one of his hairs will be cut to the ground. Conditions. John the Baptist goes about the preaching. The kingdom of God that is at hand is among them. The Pharisees come running to him and the scribes running to him. They want to find out to him, are you, are you? The Messiah says, I am not. Why are you baptizing? He says, because I'm not the one who's greater than me. But as they come to him on daily basis, he rebukes them in one time. Why is he rebuking them? They are acting as though they are one with him. They are acting as though they understand or they are in agreement with John the Baptist that Christ has come. He says, if you were in agreement, you would have shown signs of repentance. Show signs of repentance. That is what Solomon is saying to Adonijah. Show signs of repentance. Show yourself to be a worthy man. There is a condition. Show signs of, of repentance. Prove yourself that you are no longer the person that you used to be. Prove yourself that you are no longer the hypocrite. You are no longer holding on to the life of the past. Prove yourself that the door you have failed to ask for forgiveness, now that forgiveness is given to you, prove yourself that you have looked upon the king in the palace and acknowledged him to be king. But that is what Adonijah did. The Bible says he came back and he paid homage to King Solomon. In other words, he looked unto Solomon as the king in the palace, not himself. He looked up to Solomon as the God-chosen king in the palace. He realized that God has raised a new king. There has to be a realization that God has a king seated on the throne. Looking unto that king can only save your life. His life is saved, for he recognized that Solomon is king. Then forgiveness is God is given unto him. But now there's one step that he must take. He must live like a forgiven man. That's where I said I will come at last. You are forgiven, you must live like a forgiven man. He says, go home. Go to your family. Go live like a forgiven person. This man is expected to come back from his hiding, come back to the nation, come back and live as though nothing, nothing happened. He, wa he must come back to live with his family as a failure, but rejoicing because of forgiveness. He has failed his family, but now he must rejoice in forgiveness. Come back. Your past does not matter anymore. That's what Solomon is saying. That's what the king in the palace is all about. Your past doesn't matter. You came up against my father. You tried to steal the, the throne. But that doesn't matter anymore. Let bygones be bygones. 
Forgiveness means let it go. Solomon, he says, live then like a forgiven man. Come home. Do not be a stranger anymore. Walk in the light. Not in hiding anymore. Show yourself to the world that I was once lost, now I am found. Show yourself to the world that I was in hiding, now I am exposed to light. Show the world that you once were against the kingdom, you once were against the gospel. You are the chief of sinners as it were. But today you walk in the light because of forgiveness. Come home. Go back to your house. Go live a life anew. Forget the things of the world. The king in the palace gave his words to Solomon. Church, God's plan and purpose will always prevail. Therefore, church, you must align yourself with God's purposes in this life. Because his plan will always prevail. Don't fight against God's people. It didn't work for Adonijah. It will not work for you. It will never work for anyone. Don't try to take that which does not belong to you. It didn't work for Adonijah. It will not work for you. Because God preserved his people. God preserved his church, his kingdom. In his king, in the making, we see that you must not be discouraged about the chaos and disorder of this world. Or the temporal chaos and disorder. But God has always saved a people. He always has a remnant saved by grace. So keep praying. Keep praying for his will to be done. Challenging times need to leave us with a lesson. David learned his lesson. Never delay to do what is right. Nathan learned a lesson. Never delay to preach what is right at the right time. The nation of Israel learned a lesson. Never just follow a charismatic leader just because he's got charms and he's got the moves. Follow godliness. They learn. What do you learn? Remember, church, forgiveness is everything. Therefore, let go of all negative, negative emotions. Let go of all that which brings revenge into your heart. Let go. Let go of the past. Let go of the thinking that someone deserves punishment. You deserve punishment, but they didn't get it. So why does someone else deserve punishment? Let go. That's what we learn from Solomon here. One more thing. When you are forgiven, live like a forgiven person. There is expectation on you. We are expected to be a worthy man, a worthy woman, a person who has changed from his ways of the past. One that is no longer hiding but that one that is already been brought back home and given a house. Live like a forgiven person. When God gives you a true king, there is peace. Now there is peace in the kingdom. But not just in the kingdom. Because it's not easy to see that yet. Let us speak about what we can see. There is peace within. David is sitting in bed. Old at peace. Adonijah, the rebel, the sinner, is at peace. A sinner at peace because there's a king seated in the palace who's got a godly character. God raised a true king who forgives and brings strangers and rebels back to himself. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have set a king on the throne, a king of your choosing, a righteous king, a godly king, a king